oft him an hage arie bi des metu des milze, seite him mocharit jon lagulade, longe schode hreran mit hondum, rimchilde sa, war dann raklastas. Good morning. This is my swimming. <laughs> this is my swimming pool. It really is nice to come down here in summer um, and swim. It's fantastic. Beautiful place. But I'm a prisoner. You're a prisoner. We are all prisoners. If you didn't understand that piece at the beginning of the video in Anglo-Saxon Old English, the prerequisite of that was that you understand some Anglo-Saxon. If you don't, it means nothing to you. You understand me now, but the prerequisite of that is that you understand English. If you don't, it means nothing to you. So the sounds that my the air is making as it passes through my pharynx, larynx, over my tongue, through my lips, the way it propagates through the air, reaches your ear, is turned into a signal, goes to your brain and is encoded or ens deciphered. Gives you the information. And slight changes in any of those systems on the way. Simon's talked about this. So the way the tongue moves in the mouth, um, the way I end a letter, the way I start a letter, will make the information either clearer or slightly unclearer to the point where you can't understand it anymore, even though it's the same language. So, like, if I was to go back into, like, my own slang and start talking like that, defo, some people aren't going to understand what the hell I'm talking about, you know what I mean? Because now I'm speaking with a Scouse accent, and although I'm using words that are perfectly um, understandable to anybody else, especially from Liverpool, some people are going to have trouble with that. And the same thing happened with the old English bit, and I'm sure that... Uh, People will listen to that old English and think, well, he pronounced that wrong. Um, but then all of those people speaking that language would have had slight variants. There would have been slight variants in regional accents and so on and so forth. The point being that if someone were to speak Portuguese to me now, I would understand nothing of it because I don't have a system of... That, that deciphers Portuguese in my brain. So I'm a prisoner of the system that I have that allows me to understand English. Wenn ich jetzt plötzlich umschalten würde und auf Deutsch sprechen würde und wir Leute haben, die Deutsch sprechen, dann würden das verstehen. Aber wenn du kein Deutsch verstehst, hast du ein Problem. So if I was to suddenly flip it around and stop speaking, speaking English and speak German, then you would have trouble understanding me if you don't speak German. So it's, we have this system, a map that deciphers what we're hearing and allows us to encode the data from that and understand it. It's a beautiful day, as you can see. What if I say blue? We understand what blue means, if you understand English. Blau, if you understand German. But which blue were you thinking of? A dark midnight velvety blue? A bright blue of a summer sky? So you're given the word and your brain comes up with the representation. It deciphers the information, but it might decipher it in slightly different ways, which means the representation alters. The same with words. This will be the same with flavours. Uh, I don't like sprouts. Actually, I do, but you might not like sprouts because um, of primary education. You were brought up to 
think that sprouts were disgusting. Um, you might have hated them in the school. It might be a genetic disposition that you have. Um, but that variation, that representation of whether sprout flavour is nice or not, will decide whether you eat them or not. And so you might dislike sprouts. It might be epigenetic or genetic. It could be anything. Um, it's a representation. And the same goes for every sense that we have. Some people like being touched, some people don't. Music, taste, language, we are prisoners of the deciphering system in our brain that allows us to understand that sensation and allows us to represent it to ourselves and allows us then to judge that. I find this nice, I find this not nice. I like Mozart, I hate Mozart. So we're prisoners of this system. But all the time I've been saying, I am, we are prisoners of this system. And there comes the other question, what is the we or the I that is a prisoner of this system? People have asked that question for millennia and have gone off in search of the I. We're trapped in a house made of blood, flesh and bone. We beat at the windows and doors and cry to be free. And so we set out to see if anyone's home. But there's no one to seek and there's no one who's seeking called me. They're my own lyrics from the song Ghost People. Uh, I'm just looking a bit sort of worried because of him. It's okay. Chill. I'll link the video here. So we go and seek this I that is having all these experiences. And the question is, is this a separate thing? Is this the thing I was talking about in response to Simon's video? Is it the I is separate from the qualia, from the systems of information deciphering that we have? There is that system in the brain doing all of those things and something is experiencing that thing, that system of information, all of those impulses coming in and making decisions on that. It's a Cartesian theatre. It's the eye inside the theatre watching the play or the film. And people have gone and searched to find out whether the eye is separate or whether it, it's just the summation and culmination of all of those systems put together, giving a sort of, like an electron cloud, um, not an actual physical particle, but a sort of an electron cloud of the probability of an eye. All of that information collected together and represents itself to itself as a thing that it calls itself, if you know what I mean. So we're prisoners of the systems if we are the eye itself, a separate thing. But if we are the eye itself, a separate thing, that is not dependent on but an observer of those systems, and it belongs to something else, this is where the panpsychists and, you know, this is where the hard problem of consciousness, David Chalmers, and the panpsychists, Philip Goff, a fellow scouser, um, come in, the, the I is the consciousness that precedes the physical presence and adheres to different rules and is not a prisoner of the machine. It's, it's not the ghost in the machine because it's not in the machine. It's using the machine, but it's independent of the machine. And so it's free. This is why moksha, liberation in Hinduism and, you know, all meditation practices, it's the release from all of that illusion, the illusion that you're the machine, the illusion that you're the ego, the avatar that's built up inside the machine, the illusion of even thinking that you're this separate little piece, because that separate little piece isn't a separate little piece in their idea. It's a localization or appearing, appears to be a localization of the one consciousness, which is completely free. You are liberated once you are liberated from the idea that you are the ghost in the machine.
or that you even have a machine. So there's the question. If the deciphering system is that thing and it creates an avatar that allows me to navigate the world, an I that navigates the world, an ego. But the actual observer of all of that or the experience of all of that is something separate. That raises a big question. What is the observer? Is it just the amassed summation of all of those systems creating an, an, an illusion of an avatar in order to navigate the world? Or is it something separate? It's coming on to late summer and I've been out collecting my windfall apples which will be uh, stored and eaten over the next weeks and months like my blackberries which I collected earlier have a lovely weekend enjoy the last glorious days of summer and prepare for the coming Soane and uh, dark cold nights Word bis voll Arad. <laughs>